I'm 34 weeks pregnant and I used to look quite a lot because uh, the baby pressed on my bladder. Um, it's funny, this is my favourite place in the whole house. As a child, when I was growing up in Sudan, we, we never had toilets. We had to use pit latrines and sometimes in the evening we had to go to the nearest forest. You wipe yourself with the hot stones or leaves and sometimes you probably use it even though it's been used before. <laughs> uh, you can't afford to buy even old newspapers to use them as uh, toilet papers. In Eritrea and Sudan, about 65% of people haven't got access to any kind of sanitation. Sometimes people have to go to near the rivers and where they wash themselves and also use them as toilets. Apart from um, Asmara, which is the capital city, and the only reason Asmara has got toilet or sewage system is because when the Italians uh, colonised Eritrea, parts of the city had sewage and proper sanitary facilities because the Italians wanted that for themselves. Oh, <laughs> it's horrible because when we had to use special latrines at home, uh, what we do is you dig a hole in the compound so you can um, use it especially for women and children and during the day. And because they're only one meter, two meters long, they fill up quite, you know, within six months or so, you know, a year and you have to close that one and then dig another one next to it and it takes about five six years for it to dry uh, before you can use the same spot so before you know it the whole compound will have lots of places that you cannot really and as kids it was quite scary because you couldn't walk on top just in case the ground collapsed because it's quite wet I mean <laughs> you, you can't even describe it the smell was just awful. I'm sitting in a privy, which is literally a private place where you can go to the toilet. You, you went and the waste stayed beneath you. In rural areas, there might be animals who could eat it, get rid of it, you could spread it on the fields. But once people began to crowd into cities, once urbanisation and the Industrial Revolution started in this country, that simple system just didn't work. The waste just piled up. That meant that people got ill. Just diarrhoea, diarrhoea killed people. It wasn't that the people were stupid or they didn't know that it was a problem. There was just no mechanism, no organisation which helped them deal with it. The situation got so bad in the 1840s that various reformers tried different ways of solving the problem to try and prevent the terrible death toll from people living in such unsanitary conditions. In rural areas they might have used a toilet a bit like this one. It's like a closed drain pipe. The ground would be here and a seat with a hole in here. You used it until it was full to the top and then a man with a ladle would come and empty it out. In towns they used containers, usually metal ones, but because people had them outside, when toilets could flush could come inside, the, the earth closet, the, the collection pan, was associated with sort of slums and outside use. From the 1750s, you could have had a toilet with a cistern in the roof and a flush which worked by pulling a handle. A little bit of water trickles in. Oh, it pulls up and did it. It's quite sad at this day and age for people to still be, you know, using outdoors toilets uh, to go and relieve themselves. Britain had this kind of facility for the last 150 years and it's appalling, it just makes me really angry that people cannot have toilets which we take for granted here. The development of a measured flush 
was really important for flushing toilet history. You could pull and flush. It's funny, when I was a kid, we went travelling for a cousin's wedding to a refugee camp. They didn't have any toilet, so we went to a little valley. We were quite small, so we had to climb. And all of a sudden, I, you know, I pressed on something and I see my hands full of shit and I was like oh god you know every kid didn't want to say hello to me that day <laughs> and he stank yeah so for days you know I couldn't have, I couldn't get the smell of my hands because we used um basic soap which is not scented or it hasn't got any antibacterial stuff so I don't know what I cut as a kid but oh now I've got this fancy stuff I can clean myself with and it's quite healthy as well I used the bath for the first time when I was 17, 18. I've never used a proper toilet until I went to Asmara and I went to visit my friend and they had this quite posh house because they were quite rich. That was the first time I used the toilet and I saw a bath but I didn't use it. Any of the big cities, any large uh, conurbation needs uh, a flushing system. The problem with London is that it, it lies in a basin and running through the centre of it you've got the River Thames. So it means that any sewers that were built here were running into the Thames and because the Thames is tidal it meant that instead of that sewage going in and flowing away as soon as the tide turned, it was sloshing backwards and forwards. Basil Jett's idea was to build interceptory sewers that were started here in the west of London and ran parallel with the river until they got down here to Crossness. So the system worked on gravity, but it had to be lifted by the great engines either at Deptford Abbey Mills, or indeed at Crossness, where it impounded the sewage in a reservoir out at the other side. They made a kind of uh, ghost Thames under the Thames, under the London, that would carry all the effluent away and out of the city. It was more efficient, uh, it was um, man-made instead of natural, um, but it reproduces the natural processes but with um, refinements and uh, adjustments to make it more effective at doing the thing that they wanted it to do, was to take all the effluent away out of the city. And it was a great achievement. Now, if you look at this stuff over here, you wouldn't think this, that the point of this whole build is to pump shit. And what all this ironwork is saying is we're really proud of it. It's amazing. What is it about the Victorian era that made people so visionary? And how come we haven't got um, grand plans like that anymore? They were responding to a real problem. And the problem was that they'd uh, grown so quickly and so fast. Many, many more people were flushing many, many more toilets. And more of their crap was coming together. The stink was so bad. It was called the Great Stink. So they really had to do it. But then. They really knew how to get together and get things going. For them, it was um, problem resolution. And obviously, they did have a very different kind of a attitude to the world, is that they were making it. Whereas for us, we've inherited all of this architecture and all the rest of it. We're like kids compared to them. They've built the house and we're just living in it. And there's a difference in ideas. The difference between thinking that you can make the world, the engineering heroes, the Brunels, the Basil Jets, the James Watts, those kinds of characters, really felt that they were making the world anew. Whereas today, we're much more nervous and scared. We think that everything that we do is going to have terrible ramifications. We say we'd like to leave tiny footprints, you know? You can't imagine. Joseph Bazalgette saying, oh, I'd like to leave a tiny, tiny sewer. He wants to leave a great big sewer so that it can carry what it 
all the stuff that it needs to carry. He took pride in the grandness of his achievements, whereas we, by contrast, are uh, kind of scared of making an impact on the world. We think of our impact on the world as destructive. They thought of their impact on the world as creative. You're, you're, you know, I look at this now and I don't think this is luxury. This is a basic thing that everybody should have. Uh, people in Eritrea, in Sudan, or anywhere else for that matter, because this is basically what we need every day. Well, hello and welcome to Twyford's. This is the first ever one piece, all ceramic, pedestal washout closet. And it was invented by Thomas William Twyford himself in 1883. And just at that time, sanitary ware was booming. It was a big industry beginning to blossom. And Twyford called this the Unitas. Strange name, but it meant a, a, a unit piece. It really took off when Queen Victoria used one in Doncaster. And when she want, used it, of course, everybody wanted one. And it revolutionised the industry. Not much has happened in toilets since they were first invented until this arrived on the scene just a couple of years ago. And this is a concept toilet, but we call it the versatile interactive pan. The versatility of the pan comes from the fact that the bowl can be moved on that mechanism at the back to suit the height of the user and the use you're not stuck with just one height of toilet. The interactive part of this toilet is the fact that, um, well, it's connected to the internet. So this is a web-enabled toilet. Um, and why is it web-enabled? Well, in the bowl of the pan, there's a sensor, a medical sensor, and this analyzes your deposit. So let's, for instance, say that the user had got diabetes. The machine would give a readout every time it was used as to the sugar level in that particular user. Not only that, because it's connected to the internet, it will send a message to the, her, his or her GP, and the GP over the internet can keep in touch with the, with the user. Now, how good is that? It's a fantastic invention in that respect. Let's say you made a more solid deposit first thing in the morning. The machine would analyze the deposit, and let's say the user uh, hadn't got enough roughage in his diet what the machine could do would send a message directly over the wires, over the internet, to the local supermarket, and they would send a van round with some more muesli or some more beans on board to try and improve the diet. Already we've had interest from as far afield as Australia and Canada, from Africa to Russia. It's, it's, it's broken the mould in, in sanitary wear. <laughs> To get water in your prayer, especially in, in the countryside, you, you use the river. You had to walk for miles and go and get water and carry it on your head. Or alternatively, you could get donkeys and um, you put two water sacks on both sides to so balance it and the donkeys will carry water. But not everybody um, can afford to have a donkey as well because they're quite... Um, it's amazing that we can provide this fantastic natural environment for birds, but we can't bring this kind of water handling and management to people in the third world. Such a pity. Africa really needs that kind of stuff. I think the reason people are so fearful of a general rise of living standards in the South is that they've lost sight of what productive technique can do for us all, or could do for continents like Africa. And all they see is a finite landmass and an increasing number of people. Now you and I know that the ingenuity of China and India, the natural resources of Africa, are a formidable combination and if it wasn't for a whole number of historical developments which made the West want to preserve its advantage over these places, it would be much easier, it would already have happened in fact, that our major continents had joined us in the pantheon of developed countries. We've got so much to gain from their development and only a few stingy know-nothings in the uh, metropolises of the West 
would want to and seek today actively to deny to the third world what is their birthright. You know, we need more development, more technology, so we can have proper sewage systems, so that the entire country can, you know, use proper toilets and proper sanitary facilities. This is Kilda Water and it's been here in this state for 26 years. It's a man-made lake. It's the last big reservoir to have been built in Britain in 1982, and it's notable that nothing of this scale has been built since. It contains 200 billion litres of water, and that is why we have such a plentiful supply here. But this isn't just something that's used for the water supply. This is something that people enjoy for all sorts of purposes. There are lodges here, there are, there's a bird of prey centre here, people horse ride here, they walk here, people come on, on the lake and enjoy it as a resource. All sorts of benefits that people weren't thinking of when this thing was first built. When they actually went for something of this scale, they were thinking of the industrial needs of, of the region. But there are funny outcomes, you never know what's going to happen when you do something big like this. And what we've ended up with is something that provides plentiful water for a, a whole region um, and it's something that uh, we all appreciate. First thing I ever wanted my grandmother to have is um, a washing machine because my grandmother is 78, 77 and she still does all the washing by hand and I think at her age it's not fair that all her life she she washed with her hands but it's about time that you know somebody thought about these things and I'd like her to have a, a dishwasher I'd like her to have a proper flushing toilet a bathroom Sanitary ware started being developed in the 1850s well toilets like these made from a, a material called vitreous china we spray the glaze directly onto the clay piece and it's the robots which have improved productivity because we're working 24 hours a day seven days a week consistently good products which are then placed on kiln cars and then the kiln cars that go into the kiln we distribute to about 90 countries worldwide and how many toilets do we make a week about 20,000 so that's about a million a year Together with all the wash basins and cisterns and pedestals and all the raft of other stuff that goes into making a bathroom, there's about three million pieces a year leaves the factory. And our biggest single market in the export market is Nigeria. We sell more toilets to Nigeria than anywhere else in the world. The flushing toilet revolutionised health because it got it got sewage off the streets and got it safely underground away from harm's way and it was the flushing toilet that, that did that and the flushing toilet will help improve health conditions and, and the standard of living no matter where in the world they are used. Ooh, I love being here, it's just so relaxing, so good you know it just takes the weight off my bum which is quite heavy to carry around well people say that you know this is worth of water and we're denying people water by having you know baths and you know having all this but i don't think so because there is enough water the good thing about water as a resource is that can, it can never run out i mean here we are sitting on this wonderful blue planet two-thirds of which is covered with water. It evaporates, it falls back to the earth. It goes into the ground, we draw it up, it evaporates, it comes back to earth. That's the hydrological cycle. There's never any more or any less water on this earth. And that's one of the things why, actually, there's no excuse for there being water scarcity anywhere in the world. The problem is that we don't have resources like Kilda water. 
in Sudan they've got the longest river which is the Nile River and it's, it's got a, you know a huge amount of water source but because there's no technology the water is not being distributed uh, properly to people so people haven't got access to the river and all the river does is all year round just flows to the sea and get wasted so um, what we need is more development more uh, investment so people could have access to water easily I've had an allotment before and about five years ago I found this site at uh, Blondin. It's basically the principle of a green lifestyle. I usually work in an office um, nine till five. I don't get any fresh air at work. So here you can actually do something which is physical, uh, it's enjoyable and it, it's better for the environment. For, for people in the developing world, if I'm qualified to give any advice, I mean, the important thing is that people in the third world should not aspire solely um, to the type of lifestyle that we have in the developed world. We have our problems here. Don't think that the be-all and end-all of development is having flash cars and McDonald's and aeroplanes because all these things produce uh, immense problems that we have in our own life. The danger is that they all go for this material and leave the land and then they lose, uh, lose touch with the earth. Um, is it a standard of living where you can fly to Budapest for the weekend? That's not a, necessarily a good standard of living because you're impacting on other things. You're keeping me awake for one thing. Now, well, why do I need to go to Hungary for the weekend? I mean, I've travelled around the world in the past when I was younger, but I don't need to have a holiday abroad two or three times a year. I can come up here. Composting toilets were very popular in the mid-19th century. Uh, of course, in the, in the 19th century, they had people going along, collecting it from houses and bringing it out and spreading it on the fields. Well, around here, actually, to, for orchards and what have you. I think it's a criminal waste of resources to purify water to a drinkable, potable, drinkable standard and then flush it down a toilet and take that waste, which is perfectly good and is the residue of all the food that you've eaten, and then send it out to the North Sea or Mogden Sewage Works. I mean, it, it, it's madness that you purify water and then you corrupt it, and then the waste which should go back into to the land to keep it good is then literally flushed down the drain. People worry about water and the way that we use it in the home. It's a very common um, perception today that we should try and reduce our water use, that perhaps we shouldn't flush our toilets, for example. But this really doesn't make sense. It's based on a false assumption of scarcity. There is a problem sometimes getting water from A to B, but that's based on a lack of infrastructure, not on a lack of water. So, here we are, this is our composting toilet. So basically here we, what we've got inside, a pen, pen or bin where all the uh, refuse, etc. is uh, collected. I think it came to about £4,500. But if you wanted to put something like this in, in a home, then obviously you wouldn't need a, a building as big as this because this is designed for disabled people with wheelchairs. See, so I, I would have thought you could have uh, put it in a home for about £2,000. Urine is very good for breaking woody fibres down, so although we separate the urine out, there's a certain amount of backsplash, if you uh, uh, understand what I'm talking about, and that's sufficient for to activate that sort of rot rotting process. That we've got here is like the uh, it's a marine inspection hatch so uh, we can check in and see how things are going from outside in terms of the composting 
uh, situation and quantities. When it comes to actually getting the compost out we've got four screws on this panel here and that whole panel can come out and you can get a long handled spade in there to uh, dig the compost out and that's how it's done. Well, it makes me quite sick actually, all this campaigning for uh, all environmental friendly um, you know, toilets. They have got very, very low um, aspirations for the third world and Africa. It's, it's just very naive to just say people in Africa uh, could do with boreholes and latrines because how long are we going to be using these things? This is our newly installed uh, hand pump, it's a nice Romanian hand pump, which pulls it out quite nicely. Is it reasonable to use something like this in a developing uh, country? I'd say uh, absolutely, definitely. Uh, basically you're using a resource in your own locality, uh, piped water, um, well it'd be a luxury in most de uh, developing com countries anyway but very effective and generally the quality of the water that you get out of, a, uh, out of the ground is superior to, uh, to anything else and no fluorides and chlorides and anything else like that and it's perfect temperature, ground temperature as well. If people are not willing to invest properly in water then just digging a borehole is not going to satisfy a whole village or a whole town because the water that comes from boreholes is normally hard water, untreated and it's not enough, it normally runs out. I think that there is a problem with small scale projects uh, for the developing world or for anywhere. I think that small scale projects don't solve problems. People talk about them as if they're uh, interim solutions, where actually they're really being proposed as end solutions. They're about thinking small instead of about thinking big. If you compare um, offering a village a rope pump in, in one country to the, the big thinking that's taking place, for example, in South Africa, then you really um, you can see the contrast. In South Africa, there's a genuine commitment to put piped water throughout the whole country, to every village, to every home, and, and provide the sort of facilities that we take for granted in the West. Oh, baby's kicking. Most pregnant women don't go to the hospital, they end delivering at home, assisted by friends and family who might have a bit of experience but and a lot of women actually die because, as a result because there isn't medical care but it's not only the medical care it's there isn't the facilities that we take for granted for example people here want to have pool birth and that is you know even if you want that you can afford it because there isn't water <laughs> If a developing country hasn't got the means to provide plentiful water, then we should be looking at bringing that country to a level of development where you can provide those things. Making tea in Eritrea is quite a big process because um, you need to fetch the water from somewhere far. You need to fetch um, firewood from somewhere far. So. Basically, um, it takes you a lot of effort to make a cup of tea. Last year, we organised a, a water walk uh, with Worldwide, which uh, I helped to organise. Actually, it was one of the best things um, I've ever organised, really. We managed to convey the message that people in the third world or people in Africa do this every day, and uh, they shouldn't, really and it's quite hilarious because I had to help people uh, balance the bucket in their heads and everybody thought that was a cultural thing rather than something that's done out of necessity. People should higher their horizons and um, demand better things and one of the slogans we had was uh, only the best will do and I think that's how things should be.
Well, water is a critical issue in China, and unfortunately, the uh, the situation in China is is very difficult on water. There are already large parts of China that have water shortages. Um, basically, the the changes caused by global warming are actually making many of those problems worse. So, um, one that perhaps people don't think of is is when glaciers melt. Initially, of course, you get uh, a rush of water, but actually, what the glaciers in the Himalayas do in China is feed the great rivers. The glacial uh, melt accounts for a very high proportion, um, in some cases over 50% of the river's water. As those glaciers retreat, and in fact um, some scientists in China predict that they'll be completely gone within the century, then the, the, the water flow into the great rivers of China that basically support life and necessities for most of the Chinese population will be extremely reduced. So the first thing I would suggest is that the climate issue has to be taken both as a critical problem that we have to try and mitigate, um, reduce the effects as much as possible. But more importantly, perhaps on this particular issue, it has to be taken into account with every decision that is made around social development and infrastructure. We can no longer assume that you can drop in technologies. And I think then the other important lesson to learn, which has been, um, I think, well explored by, by other NGOs, is that you need appropriate technologies for those regions. So looking for um, solutions that don't require water, such as, I don't know, composting toilets or, or low water solutions is going to be crucial. Um, and we have to recognize that, that these aren't problems that you can solve by piping water from one big river, say from the Yellow River across to another part of China. Those are the big solutions perhaps that, that may have worked previously, we always will have had environmental problems attached to them, but now are simply not going to work. Quite often people are talking about huge timescales. People are talking about glacial retreat over a century. Um, that to me seems a really staggeringly poor way of thinking about it. A century? Just think where we were in Britain a century ago. Think how far we've come. You actually look at what development brings. You look at what human imagination brings. You, you look at what new technologies bring, what, what social change brings. A century is a time scale. I can't imagine what sort of world that we'll live in in a century. I hope that it will be one that's a thousand times better than this one. If the people who spend all their time worrying about climate change and trying to keep things as they are, then it will be a poor reflection of today's world instead of one that's several times better. It is a fact that glaciers are retreating. If we think that there's a, a problem um, because of rising sea levels, let's actually deal with that. Let's move the water while it's still fresh water to where we want to use it. Let's look at the problem in a way that's actually beneficial to mankind. I remember Ken Livingston talking about people to, to not flush unless they've had a poo recently. And I was keen to take his advice and typically am back at home. A solution such as a desalination plant would only allow people to keep on consuming at the rate that they're consuming. And to, uh, I think the only way to force people to change their ways is by uh, seeing the effects of what they do. And a desalination plant would do none of that. I noticed that when you fly over, um, when you're landing in Australia, in Sydney, or even in Auckland, New Zealand, and, and even in, actually in London, like um, there are a lot of people who have like sw in-ground swimming pools in their homes, and I just think that's probably a bit excessive. Um, it's, yeah, I just think, I actually think no one needs those things, you know, especially when we consider how much, um, how valuable water is as a resource and how it is finite. See, I think people in developing countries should aspire to lots of things um, you know even if it's swimming pools and jacuzzis but obviously with the current water shortage on the planet you know maybe it's not the best idea I don't know it's a difficult question because you can't say they shouldn't aspire to something I mean they've been aspiring to you know getting themselves out of poverty uh, you know, they've been aspiring to lots of and they shouldn't not aspire to certain things it's just a difficult one because of the way you know we have to conserve water in the world at the moment I mean you can't have everyone Having a jacuzzi in a swimming pool, there just be wouldn't wouldn't any water left at all. We're not careful, so definitely boreholes and hand pumps a good thing.
Many people worry about climate change and there are some genuine issues there that do need to be addressed. One of the major issues is do we try to lower consumption of energy and also of water to try to deal with the effects of all of this or do we organize better energy production systems and better water production systems so that we don't have to level down but actually can adapt to the change in a way that raises living standards, not just in the West but in the third world. Now I think trying to cut back our consumption is first of all unrealistic, millions of working class people won't do that and why should they do it? Because they actually enjoy fairly low levels of consumption even in the metropolitan countries of the North. And second of all, it's wrong because in consuming more, we develop our resources, we improve the richness of our leisure time, we're able to educate and uh, recreate our kids better. And that's important for humanity. There's nothing wrong with consumption. I think the solution to these problems lies with power stations and desalination plants, with genuine human innovation on a large scale, not in everybody behaving like monks in their own home. It just won't do. There's bigger things in life. There's a higher calling in life and one of those callings is to solve poverty in the third world, not try to impede third world development by telling them that their water is limited and their energy stocks are low. So is it feasible to desalinate seawater to make drinking water for a city the size of London? Well, in fact, this is already done in the Middle East and on many holiday islands in the Mediterranean. What we can do is pump seawater through a very fine membrane, something called a reverse osmosis membrane. Very, very fine. It's so fine that only water molecules can go through and all the salt is left behind. And we can do that on a gigantic scale. So is desalination practicable and affordable now? Well, 20 or 30 years ago, only the Middle East could afford the energy and the cost of desalination. But there have been some fantastic developments in the technology and the energy efficiency of desalination. So that today, we could produce desalinated tap water for London within the current price that we sell fresh water to London. People do say that uh, these sorts of things are very costly. Pro providing plentiful water is costly. But it really depends on what you value. If you value people, if you value people's quality of life, then why would you think of something like water and our use of water as too costly? Well, being a man, what can I say? It's quite rewarding just, you know, looking at this little person you just brought to the world. This is great, I love swimming pools, it's just absolute heaven now that I've learned to swim at my old age you know everybody should have this today perhaps for the first time in history well it is for the first time in history we have the technology and the capability to provide good quality water and plentiful supply to every person on this planet when I've heard about people who argue that we should use less water and conserve these, uh, it's just it's kind of shocking for me, really, to come from a country where there's no water resources as much as here. It, to me, it sounds like it's this obsession with, you know, people trying to tell us we should consume less, we should use less, rather than, you know, asking for, you know, better development and more. Why should we go back to, you know, living like primitives? Because it took us all these years to be where we are. You know, I'm talking in terms of, you know, how society has progressed. And now to be told not to flash the news. I just, I just don't think that um, that is the answer. You know, there's plenty of water in this country that can be used. For example, desalination of the water, which is a very simple process. You know, there's plenty of water up north. You know, it rains bloody every day in this country. Why can't we use that water? It's going to be embarrassing to tell all these people who come here for the Olympics to tell them not to flash the loose. What are they going to think of us? It's just like, you know, you come to Britain, a lot of these people are going to be coming from everywhere, from especially from the third world countries. And if they come here and they've been told not to flash the loo after having a pee. Companies like Twyfed make um, lots and lots of toilet 
if I had money, I'd you know I'll make some. And you know why why can't they give everybody a flashing loo in the world? And you know everybody deserves that because you know it's it's not even money that's stopping development anymore. It's ideas and organisations uh, telling us that we need to consume less and we don't need what the West have and what the West have got is a mistake. How can you tell me this is a mistake? You know, having a nice paddling pool or swimming pool and having flashing loose, you know, all these things that people have got here in the West, you know, tell that to somebody who's living in Eritrea who's got to carry water in their head for three miles. Tell that that is a mistake. And, you know, um, I think the West should wake up, that we should start thinking about, you know, serious development and serious programs about infrastructure, building sewage system, building proper water reservoirs. And, you know, that's the only way forward.